Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm Juan Sanchez. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, WPE WebKit and how we uh, have created it to enable the use of uh, HTML5 in uh, low-end and embedded devices. Uh, but before starting uh, with the actual content of the talk, uh, I'd like to, to tell you a bit about myself and, and, and the company I work uh, in. Uh, so I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Igalia. Uh, we are an open source consultancy. We created the company in 2001 and work uh, uh, globally for like, customers all over the world and, and have also distributed a team of 60 engineers currently. Um, we are an open source consultancy, which means that we have uh, teams that work in different open source projects in areas such as uh, browsers, multimedia graphics, compilers, or software-defined networking, among other things. Um, and particularly in the case of browsers, uh, Igalia has been, during the last uh, 10 years, one of the top contributors to uh, the main open source uh, browser projects, uh, for example, WebKit, Chromium, or Firefox, and all the components that are related to them. And what we do is basically helping uh, companies in industry which want to use these uh, pieces of software in different kind of kinds of devices. In many cases, uh, things like tablets, phones, smart TVs, uh, automotive, or lately in the last two, three years, uh, more and more kinds of uh, a variety of embedded devices, uh, which is what I'm going to mainly talk uh, today about. Uh, so the, the talk, I'm going to try to, to split it in three parts so that it's clearer. The first one uh, is going to be an explanation of the problem that we want to solve and why we came up with, the, with this new solution that is called WPE. In the second one, I will get a bit more into detail in the, uh, about the architecture of WPE and the functionality and how exactly it, work, it works internally. And in the third one, I, I'll talk a bit more about the, how the project is nowadays and where we are going, how, how we are thinking about the future. Um, so let's start with the first uh, part, the, the problem uh, that we want to solve. Uh, I guess this is not a secret uh, for anybody here, but just in case. Uh, as you know, um, many embedded devices are getting sophisticated. Uh, it's very common today that, that they have some kind of GNU Linux uh, version with a touch screen and uh, people building them want, want to run apps uh, on them. Uh, this is quite common today, as I said, but it will be even more common. Uh, we know that many companies are working in new versions of their embedded devices that will be more similar to this. And at the same time, uh, the web is a powerful platform, it's very flexible, and probably more important than that is that many people know it, and it's kind of in the comfort zone of a big amount of developers. So it's very common to see that, uh, that these uh, embedded uh, manufacturers want to put HTML5 applications in their, in their touch screens. Uh, also, in many cases, they use in, in many of these cases, the, the, the exact uh, case that they want to solve is a kind of kiosk mode, full screen browser where they are running their applications. Um, so this is kind of the configuration of the use case that we want to target with this technology. And of course, it's still low end hardware in many cases. Hardware that doesn't have a lot of memory, that doesn't have a very powerful G uh, CPU, that typically has a GPU that can be used, uh, but of course there are a lot of optimizations that are needed compared to more powerful uh, hardware. Uh, so now that we understand the problem, the question here is, okay, which solutions can we, can we use uh, for this? Uh, of course the solutions need to be focused on li being lightweight, as I already explained, um, and we don't need to solve uh, all the possible use cases of a web browser in this in this particular scenario. We are saying that we want to solve a very specific case, uh, which is limited. So we need to look into the different uh, alternatives that are available in, in open source and see how good or bad they are. And the main three ones, the obvious choice for, choices for everybody are Firefox and their related technologies, Chromium with uh, Blink in its core and V8 as the JavaScript engine or WebKit. So I'll look a bit into uh, how uh, good they would be for this particular problem that I just defined. Uh, th the case of Firefox, uh, as you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a 
uh, very stable technology that has been used uh, uh, as a browser for many years. But uh, already almost 10 years ago, Mozilla decided that uh, embedders or, or creators of, of new web browsers uh, were not their, their priority. So they are not uh, providing a, an API, a stable API. Um, and actually, since uh, really 2006, 2008, many open source browsers moved away from, from Mozilla uh, technologies because of this. So it's very focused on, on Firefox as a product and it has a quite monolithic architecture. Things could be more interesting now with Servo, this new project by Mozilla that tries to rewrite parts of, or potentially the whole uh, Firefox uh, technology stack, uh, but it's still too early. Servo is just partially used inside the Firefox for now, so it's not really a solution for, for our case for now. The second option that I was listing is, is Chromium. Chromium is, uh, as you know, is the kind of the core of, of Google Chrome very powerful, it has a lot of features, it implements uh, many uh, web standards compared to, to alternatives, uh, but it also has a quite unflexible architecture. It's a kind of a, it needs to be used as a whole, uh, and it doesn't provide a stable API to build the, your own flavor on top of, of it. So you end up having to fork Chromium, and this is a serious issue because, uh, I mean, you, you need to make sure, to be sure that you want to do it, because it's a very, fast-moving project, uh, and forking it, it requires a lot of resources uh, to maintain the fork and to stay close to, to upstream. There are some interesting solutions that are uh, trying to build uh, something f friendlier for embedders on top of, of Chromium. Uh, one of them is CEF, uh, Chromium Embedded Framework. Uh, and the other one is uh, Qt Web Engine, which is how uh, Qt, the, the, the graphical toolkit, provides uh, kind of a web view for uh, putting web content there. Both are interesting, but uh, they have some issues. Uh, in general, they are not very, like, Chromium is not particularly optimized for very low-end devices. It's not like the main target for Google and for the community. Also things li like Wayland, which can be very interesting for, em for um, embedded devices manufacturers, are not really yet very well supported for Linux particularly. And also there are some licensing issues is even for some for some users. For example, in the case of Qt Web Engine, uh, it's GPL version 3 or commercial license, which is for some uh, people a, a very strong limitation. So it's interesting, but not really either the perfect solution, apparently. So we can uh, we come to the third option that I had in the list, which is WebKit. Uh, WebKit is comparable to to Chromium in many ways, is the engine that is inside the uh, Safari uh, in the different platforms that uh, Apple supports. It's not maybe as complete in terms of functionality as Chromium, but very close. Uh, and it has, it does have a very uh, flexible architecture. It was designed from the beginning uh, to support different platforms, to enable changing components. And there's a very uh, interesting concept that is the port. So in WebKit, you can create your own port of WebKit. I will talk more about this later. But the ports uh, provide a stable API that can be maintained upstream as part of WebKit uh, in general, which is very useful for the thing we want to, to do. So the cost of maintenance is, is less uh, because you are doing it as part of, of the community. There are already a few ports uh, that are very well known in WebKit. Uh, some are upstream, uh, of course, the ones that Apple maintains, but also WebKit GTK, for example, which is very very uh, well known in the Linux desktop. And many downstream ones are maintained in different places, some of them proprietary, some of them open source, but outside of the upstream tree. Uh, one example is EFL, uh, Qt WebKit is another one. Sony uses their own uh, in their architectures. Etc. There are many really here, but none of them is really uh, exactly what we were looking for either. They are not targeting embedded uh, low-end devices, so we decided that WebKit was a very good choice, but we wanted to create a new port uh, specific for this uh, use case that I defined before. So uh, this hopefully explains why it was needed to create something uh, a little bit new. Uh, now I will discuss uh, further how exactly we created it. So what is uh, WP? Well, first I need to explain, because I guess in the audience not everybody is familiar with the architecture of WebKit, a little bit about how WebKit is structured. Um, so this picture shows very simplified uh, 
the different components that you have when you are trying to create a browser, which is the application there, using WebKit. Um, there's, a, there's a big part that is called WebCore that is reusable for potentially all the ports of WebKit. And then there are parts uh, which are blue and orange there that are specific for each port. So the, the blue one is the layer that the application developers will use, the, the browser developers in this case, will use to uh, access to the all the functionality of the port. And the orange ones are th all the uh, connections to the specific libraries in the platform that you are going to use uh, to actually uh, do what you want to do with the browser. Um, and there's, of course, a JavaScript engine, which in WebKit typically is JavaScript core, although potentially you could use another one. So uh, this means that uh, different parts of WebKit share a lot of code, but at the same time can become very specific to the target platforms that they are trying to uh, work on. For example, in this picture you can see how this becomes more specific for two uh, ports, the WebKit GTK port and the Qt port. So in the case of the GTK port, that will be a GLib, GObject, GTK-friendly API that you could use to create applications, potentially a browser. Um, and then uh, in the orange square there, you can see that you use a list of libraries, for example, GStreamer uh, for media content or uh, ATK for accessibility and a list of other things that you need to bind the generic uh, implementation of WebKit to your specific platform. So this was just to, ex uh, expl uh, to explain the what is a port, because we are here explaining a new port of WebKit. What are the key requirements of this port? Uh, I already mentioned some, but I want to get a bit more uh, complete now. Uh, again, we initially we are going to be targeting full screen content. It's not true anymore because WP evolved and it also supports other things, but like the main use case is full screen. You have something full screen, you run a set of applications there, which are HTML5. We want it to be fast and lightweight, lightweight in, in terms of memory, uh, but also the space you need in disk, uh, or of course the amount of CPU that you are going to be using. And also very important, uh, we want a minimal set of dependencies. We want really to keep it as small as possible in all these uh, different uh, meanings of small. But at the same time, because of, I mean, because as I said before, the embedded devices are getting sophisticated. Um, we need to support uh, almost all the typical HTML features. Particularly, we need to support WebGL. Uh, we, we want to have accelerated canvas. And of course, because this is a demand by every user of the, of the board nowadays, uh, accelerated hardware transitions, CSS transitions, and also video playback, which needs to be accelerated as well. So it's pretty, uh, yeah, quite a long list of interesting things here. So how we decided to do this, uh, the creation of this new port? Well, we took uh, WebKit GTK as a kind of a starting point, and then uh, we decided that uh, this is a very mature port. It has, has been maintained for uh, f 15 years now. And we want to use part of it that is very stable. At the same time, we want to rethink the whole uh, structure. So we want to remove the toolkit completely, the toolkit layer, GTK disappears. And we want to make it platform agnostic. Platform meaning the graphical uh, stack that we are going to use. I will talk more about this in the next slide. For media, we are going to use GStreamer, which is uh, almost uh, uh, the, the, ma it's ob the obvious choice uh, for Linux, and we, st we use JavaScript Core as the, as the JavaScript engine. We, we reduce the, the list of dependencies to a few uh, um, important libraries. Some of them are, are there. Most of them are there, actually. And we use J uh, JLES for, for hardware-accelerated rendering. So everything is going to be very connected to, uh, to OpenGL. The architecture is quite uh, complex. In the box that I mentioned uh, earlier, I was I didn't get into detail about, for example, the blue box here. But the blue box uh, hides uh, quite, quite a lot of complexity in terms of uh, multi-threading. So in our port, we also uh, implement quite a lot of uh, different uh, uh, processes and threads there. So for example, there is a process for the UI, a process for the web, which takes care of the rendering one for the network, one for the storage, and potentially there could be more. And at the same time, there's a heavy use of threading uh, as well for performance reasons in composition, image decoding, or, or even in media playback. Um, 
So this is kind of the key ideas of the architecture. At the same time, there's a, an even more important one that is the concept of uh, backends. Yes? Uh, both, uh, uh, there's a long story about this, but the short summary, the short answer is that the Qt WebKit is not upstream, so it's kind of downstream thing. Qt, like main Qt moved to Chromium, so WebKit GTK is really developed as part of upstream WebKit, and it's uh, it, it's a more more interesting choice today. Um, okay, so the other thing I was going to say is that. Uh, on top of these key ideas for the architecture, we are also we came up also with the idea of having different graphical backends. Typically in WebKit, uh, the configuration will be that you have uh, the generic part and the port part. We have here in this particular uh, WP port, we have a third part, which is the, the graphical backends. The main goal here is to have a very efficient way of uh, using uh, the buffers uh, where we are going to render independently from uh, the specific stack that we use. So that the, the generic part of WebKit doesn't really care about if we are using Wayland or we are using libgb, uh, uh, GBM, sorry, or native implementations such as the ones in the Raspberry Pi with the Broadcom uh, stack, the Broadcom provided drivers. So uh, basically the backends are libraries that are separate from WebKit uh, uh, WP and you can uh, link them depending on the one you want to use. They will provide the uh, uh, rendering targets and also uh, display a uh, way to display the contents uh, in the screen. Uh, for now, we are focusing on uh, OpenGL, but we have also uh, already people from our graphics team looking into how to support Vulkan uh, down the line. So in the coming months, we will be working on Vulkan support as well. If you uh, take a look to the available backends, uh, you will see already a few of them uh, which are uh, quite mature. So th this one called Live. GVM, which we use when the hardware is Intel, AMD, uh, with the open source NVIDIA drivers. There's one called Wayland EGL, uh, which uses Wayland internally, and uh, uh, we use, for example, when we have ARM Mali drivers. There's uh, the, like the main one that we are using for now is the third one there, LibWeb, uh, uh, LibWB backend RDK is called in the, in the repository, and it supports uh, the Raspberry Pi and a few other uh, target hardwares that are very important for us. We are also working on an experimental backend for Android, which already works, but uh, it's still not uh, fully public. Um, okay, so the architecture is a combination of traditional WebKit port ideas with this concept of backends, which make uh, this port more, a little bit more flexible in terms of what we can support. I was mentioning before that one of the key goals is uh, being lightweight, so I wanted to comment a bit about how true I it is. Uh, we are using the ra different Raspberry Pis as kind of the reference ha hardware. We support many other things, but the Raspberry Pis 0 to 3 are kind of the ones we are using for checking regressions, uh, developing uh, in a way that, that we make sure that the performance is good. We also use desktop, of course, for uh, main development. Uh, currently, for some configurations, you can have uh, fully uh, working WP uh, in only 40 uh, megabytes in disk. And in the memory footprint, when it's working and uh, rendering uh, relatively s uh, simple uh, web applications is uh, lower than 100 megas. So we have customers that are using these in devices where they have 200 megas in total, maybe 100 for the OS, 100 for the web applications, and it works. Uh, and we can pl play things like YouTube TV, fully supported with all the functionality required there in the Raspberry Pi 1, uh, even in the zero with, with some limitations. So it's quite lightweight. Uh, another thing that I want to highlight is that we are uh, putting a lot of effort in media support. Uh, this is because the main use case of WP at the beginning was, was uh, media uh, playing. I will discuss this a bit more in a few slides. Uh, so we are uh, being very careful with uh, having hardware accelerated uh, decoding. Uh, we use the streamer for that, so it's quite powerful. It brings a lot of functionality already. And uh, also hardware accelerated video rendering. Uh, again, because we want to support transformations on top of the video, we want to support uh, modifying the video with CSS. Um, we, in very specific cases, can, can use also external rendering, which is not ideal, but can be used when you really want something very powerful in a very, very low-end device. 
Uh, we are working hard in supporting these three standards. Uh, uh, MSC is fully supported already. MSC is this media source extensions that uh, enable to complement the behavior of the video tags with JavaScript and is used by many uh, well-known content providers, including YouTube as well. Uh, so we, we passed the conformance test 2016. We are working on the new one. We support fully MP4, and we are working on WebM so that we can enable also BP8 and BP9. Uh, at the same time, we have a team working on media uh, en on encrypted media extensions, uh, EME. Uh, the version one, so-called, is already supported as well, so you can basically buy uh, content in YouTube and play it. And we are working now on what is called the version three, the latest one, uh, which is has a better architecture, is object-oriented, it uses promises. And uh, there we want to support the different uh, uh, CDMs, including uh, Play Ready and Widevine. In the, in the version one, we only support Play Ready. So we are working on the open source part of this, of course. Uh, EME defines how the open source part needs to talk to the uh, proprietary uh, software here. And the third one that we are also uh, working hard on is WebRTC, which is also a priority for our users. We initially created a prototype using OpenWebRTC, uh, which was uh, gstreamer based, but it, it had some limitations because OpenWebRTC is not uh, uh, really well maintained nowadays. So we decided now to start using LibWebRTC, which is the same library that uh, Chromium and Firefox are using, originally created for Chromium. And we have already a prototype of this working, and are adding. We are adding uh, features on top of it. We are in collaboration with Apple, which is also planning to use this for their uh, ports in WebKit. So there's a, there's a strong focus on media I, uh, again, uh, and this uh, finishes the second part, which was a highlight of the application of the architecture of WP. Uh, the main ideas behind it, the back ends, and the, and the strong focus on media, trying to keep everything lightweight. So now the question is, how is the port doing? Uh, what's the status today? So I want to go a bit back and understand the, uh, a little bit more about the history of this port. We, we started the project in 2014. It was an internal experiment, uh, trying to use all the knowledge of being working in browsers for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, after that, we, we understood that it had a lot of potential, and we put uh, a, a team, a permanent team, working on it uh, for, for the last two and a half years. And in May this year, so a few months ago, it became fully integrated in upstream WebKit. So now it's a fully uh, accepted uh, open source part of the project. Uh, we have a stable team working on it, pretty big team, and we have a community that is growing. So we have now external contributors, other companies that are using it, other companies that are contributing things. Uh, there are also other companies that are even taking it and creating their own proprietary solution uh, and eventually contributing some things back. And functionally, it's quite complete. It can be used for many things. There's still things that need to be improved, but uh, it's really uh, quite stable and quite mature. Actually, I can talk a bit about adoption. I mean, this is a port that uh, even when it's young as an upstream port, it has been developed for a while, and it's already used by some uh, companies. Uh, a big part of the work was initially, and still now, uh, sponsored by Metrological, which is a media company that is a provider inside the RDK consortium for uh, companies, big companies such as uh, Comcast or Liberty Global. Um, and they basically use WP as one of the key uh, pieces in the architecture, in the, in the platform that they have uh, for set-top boxes. And the WP is already deployed in more than 10 million set-top boxes by these companies, mainly by Comcast, uh, but Liberty is also starting to uh, deploy it, and the number is growing uh, very fast. At the same time, although this was the initial use case, uh, the port has uh, proven to be uh, quite useful for other uh, examples, uh, other uh, embedders. And we have been seeing in the last year uh, a lot of companies coming to WB and deciding to use it for things like elevators, uh, speakers, uh, vending machines, uh, cameras, printers, uh, a lot of different uh, use cases where you share this idea of having a touch screen where you want to put some HTML5 applications and you have a, a hardware that is not extremely pow powerful. 
Uh, this means that uh, we have been adding support for new hardware in the last uh, months. Uh, you have seen already a few backends, and they are being uh, more and more complete in terms of supporting new hardware. But uh, still, there's uh, cases that we don't support, and we are still working on, on increasing this list as much as possible with new backends or with making the available backends more st uh, more complete. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk a bit also about where we are putting the effort nowadays, where which areas are the ones where we are, uh, our team is working harder so that we complement what we have with, with new stuff. One of the things is releases. Until now, the port has been like developing like crazy, preparing for upstream. So we didn't put a lot of uh, effort in making stable releases. Now we are doing it. We have a team preparing the first release now. It's coming out in a couple of weeks. And we will be doing this every six months, stable releases every six months with intermediate releases in the middle, in a very similar way to how the WebKit GTK port uh, does this. Uh, for now, they will be kind of preview releases. We are not going to commit to fully uh, stable APIs, but uh, after a while, they will become fully stable, and we will guarantee uh, backwards compatibility for future releases. So this is one thing that for us is, is very important. The other one, uh, the second one, is uh, improving the QA infrastructure. There's a, there's a very strong QA uh, process in, in WebKit upstream. There's a huge amount of tests. There are build bots. There are continuous, there's continuous integration, of course. But we want to extend this more to, to, to all the supported hardware. Uh, we want to really make sure that when we uh, do a new release, uh, there, there things are still working. And what is even more difficult to, to prove sometimes that there are no performance regressions in all the different platforms. So we are building in, in we are building a farm basically of embedded devices where we are going to be testing all this uh, continuously. Um. Hello. Hello. Okay. I can use this one. Hello. Okay. Let's use this one. <laughs> okay. So QA. Uh, improve. Another another thing is the documentation. Documentation. Uh, again, it was not very complete. We are working in architecture documentation, API documentation. There will be in the in the coming weeks a project website coming out with all the details. And then in terms of technical uh, work, we are also uh, heavily working in, in those six areas that you can see there. The first one is we are uh, adjusting some things in the graphical architecture because we want to uh, make sure that we are competitive all the time with all the uh, in, uh, improvements that, for example, Chromium is doing. So we are trying to simplify some of the layers, um, potentially replace some of the libraries. We will see. There, there's a lot of ideas there. We are starting to work on them. Of course, we, we, we need to keep working on EME, MSC, and WebRTC. As you saw before, they are very important for us. We have some support that we want to support the new versions. And it's a lot of work, really, to, to make all that work uh, properly. We are uh, defining a plan for 2018 uh, to improve the networking uh, stack, particularly Libsoup is, has some issues. We are going to take over the maintenance. We are going to improve it. And we are going to improve some things in the security in, on the browser side including uh, better, better sandboxing, for example. Uh, we have started already working in some other standards. For example, uh, WebDriver is already fully supported. Uh, very recently was added. We are working on WebGL2, full support. And we are even experimenting with, web, with WebVR, uh, implementing the API and doing some optimization so that you can uh, prototype uh, VR things using uh, this port as well. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, modest things compared to maybe things that will be running in a very powerful hardware, but still useful for some of our uh, users. Another very important thing is that JavaScript core is really focused on 64 bits, but for us, 32 are very are key because some of the hardware we are running things on are uh, ARM v6, ARM v7, even MIPS. In, in set of boxes, MIPS is very popular. So we are putting a team of people working together with Apple so that the support for 32 bits is as good as the one for, th uh, for 64, which is uh, kind of uh, still not there nowadays. And finally, we are working more on the Android prototype, which opens new, new doors uh, for the port. It's not kind of top priority, but for us it's an interesting experiment that we want to uh, continue doing. Uh, and with this, I come to the, to the, to the end of the talk. Um, 
everything I mentioned here is open source, fully open source, and also fully developed in, in the open. Uh, we have basically two, two, uh, two repositories. One of them is the upstream WebKit repository, obviously. So if you get WebKit there, you can uh, uh, build everything. But then also, uh, we sometimes people ask about why, but we have another repository that is kind of a downstream where we have a few things that don't really belong to, to upstream. One of them is the uh, very specific hacks for set-top boxes and some hardware that we are using there, which is still open source, but kind of ad hoc. So we don't want to mix it with the uh, pure upstream implementation. And also a few other things that we are kind of experimenting with, and we want to be really freely experimenting there. So we have some branches there that are, uh, yeah, the playground for us. And then eventually many of them become upstream after a few weeks or after a couple of months. It depends. So if you want to check this out, you need to take a look to the two repositories. We will probably mainly use the upstream one, but we can also take a look to the other one. Maybe your use case will, will take advantage of this set-top box specific things. And of course, collaboration is welcome. We really see this as a very open project. We welcome companies, individuals, and people testing new, new hardware. Uh, if you want to check this, also this, uh, like, uh, leave. We have a demo in the in the booth area. We are going out to the left, to your right, uh, at, the, at the corner, end corner, and we have a couple of demos there running on Raspberry Pi 2. You can see YouTube TV fully supported. You can see uh, how WP uh, does transformations in a full HD video in a quite a soft way. I think it's interesting so that this uh, complements what I mentioned today in the talk. And this is it. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'm happy to uh, answer. Yeah, I think I need to pass the mic, so I will be <laughs> moving around. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, how many people did initial port? And uh, second, um, have you got uh, meta layer for Yocto? And uh, what's the state of IM6, for example? I am too slow. No. Okay, so three questions. Uh, the, the size of the team uh, varied uh, a lot. In total, we are 16 in the company, and uh, about half the company is directly or indirectly working on WP in different layers. Probably 20 of them are working on like the port itself. The other 10 are working in, in the core things, adding new standards, working on some media related things. We have also people working on GStreamer, which could be counted. So something like 30 people, uh, but fully working in the port, maybe uh, 20 or 15, 20. Uh, the second question is about Yocto. Yes, we have recipes uh, upstream for Yocto. Uh, we try to be uh, to make things easy for people using Yocto and other different uh, uh, projects that are similar to Yocto. So most of them are supported. You have different recipes for different hardware, so it should be easy to test this. And the third one about Freescale, uh, actually it's one of the uh, hardware, uh, specifically IMX6 uh, solo and I think it's called Duality. Those two, uh, we have been using them for a couple of customers and they are supported uh, and they work pretty well. We have been uh, testing the performance there. Uh, our customers are using this for uh, quite uh, sophisticated animations with CSS and things work pretty well, yes. So you can check it out. There were other people, I think. Uh, yeah, okay. I think they were first, then I, I'll come here. just wanted to know what kind of licenses VPE is using. Okay, so licensing. Uh, we are using the same licenses that uh, WebKit uses, which is, if I'm not wrong, uh, GPL version 2 and some parts are BSD. So like the specific parts that are port specific because we inherited this license from WebKit GTK are uh, GPL version 2. The, the core parts are, are, are BSD, so it's uh, basically a quite per permissive licensing. Uh, and you were next, right? <laughs> How complex would it be to add web USB or uh, device drivers for peripherals? 
Okay, this is something, if I understand correctly, the, the question is about device APIs, some, something like that. Uh, we have been experimenting with that for automotive, for example. Uh, so you need to basically connect the lower layers to JavaScript and offer an extended API. This is not very difficult to do. Uh, it's probably not something that will belong to upstream uh, because it's a specific use case, but the technically it's not very difficult. You have to connect the the callbacks basically that you want to, to, to call in C to the JavaScript layer using some artifacts that are there already in JavaScript core. So our experience is that it's something that can be done uh, quite quickly. I think you need to use this because they are recording. Uh, based on your answer of the device APIs, uh, what was the you're trying to do uh, in uh, JavaScript with uh, automotive? Uh, can you explain? So this this was the what we were trying to do in the case of automotive was accessing some uh, sensors and some data from the car basically. So this is not, you cannot use a W3C standard API for this, but there are automotive specific APIs that you need to implement. So you need to expose to the JavaScript application this API. And it's, for example, knowing the speed the car is moving at or even interacting down to the car and say, okay, uh, please accelerate. This kind, this kind of specific APIs. Accelerating for JavaScript, right? Interesting. <laughs> Um, for the backends, is that uh, build time selection, or can it be selected at runtime? For example, you have the Wayland and the basically the uh, bare metal version. So, could you select at runtime which one you use? Uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure about this. I think most of the work we have done uh, so far is is at uh, building time. Uh, I'm not really sure about the limitations for doing it uh, the way you were explaining. We can take it maybe after the after the talk and, and discuss it. Uh, anybody else? Okay, thank you very much.